There's a theory going around, and I must say it depresses me, that uh, print is obsolete and that books are going out of style. Its proponent, of course, is Marshall McLuhan. I don't know, maybe he's right. Uh, we have an example right here in the case history of um, one product of the post-television era who is our most successful Canadian film producer. It's the Pierre Burton Show, the program that comes to you from the major capitals of the world. This edition comes to you from Toronto. And Pierre's guest is Don Shabib, whose award-winning film, Going Down the Road, was on the 10 best list of several leading U.S. critics, and whose newest film, Rip Off, has just been released. And here's Pierre. Well, Don Shabib is a child of television in the McLuhan age. I guess you can't remember. Can you remember a period when there wasn't a TV set? Yeah, actually, I sort of came in at, at the, you know, I was really 14 before we got our first television, and then um, uh, it really sort of dominated my life to quite an extent after that. Well, you have said publicly that you're totally educated by television. I find that difficult to believe. I, I would, by the media, I think, because uh, when I got out of high school, I must have been just about the dumbest kid in the world, <laughs> even though I had, you know, a fairly good academic record. And uh, when I was 17 or 18, I started watching CBC, you know, as opposed to just westerns yeah. and stuff. And I, and I really got myself education, educated that way and on radio. It's said that uh, there's no educational television. Of course, all television, in a sense, is educational. Anything that shows you any corner of the world is an education. Yeah, well, we, we've actually had educational television all along, and because the CBC is really half and half, you know. Oh, I think, I, I think every uh, television show there is, bad, good, or indifferent, does something to your mind, and it mm -hmm. opens it up in some way. My quarrel, I guess, with a lot of it, it that uh, it wastes a lot of its time not opening up your mind when it could do that right. and be entertaining as well. But is, is this true that you don't read books? That you, uh... No, I, I don't. I you got, don't? The last time I read like a novel or a play or anything like that was Pride and Prejudice, which I had to read 15 years ago in grade 13. You haven't read a book since Pride and Prejudice? No. That's a terrible one to stop with, if you ask me. <laughs> Maybe that's why you stopped. It was stopped. on the course. <laughs> it was never my... I'm not one of those who says Jane Austen was a very great writer, but I'm in the minority in that, too. So you haven't... Why can't you read? Is it, is it that you can't read or you don't read? Or is it this, just a stubborn visual thing with you? I guess it, it became almost a perceptual handicap after a while. I, um, I know by the time I got to the to, uh, University of Toronto, I, I had to read textbooks, but I did as little of that as possible. It got to the point where I had to sit down and force myself to read by underlining every word with a pencil and ruler. I just look at the page and I just went, just fell totally to sleep. Is this the result of being uh, attuned to television, of being conditioned by the, by the visual medium? I, I, don't, I really don't know. It's, I, I, like, I read a lot when I was a kid, so it wasn't like I was you know, a, a, yeah. a difficult reader when I was in grade one well, or something that's before like you that. had TV, which you got when you were 14. Right. <laughs> well, what if somebody sends you a script? Can you read that? It, I can, but I, you know, it's, I, I find it difficult to, to get all the way through it. It takes me a long time to read it. And yet, you are quoted as saying that you'd like to make a film out of The Three Musketeers. How could you know about The Three Musketeers if you don't read? Well, I read all the classic comics. Just so. That's, that was my part <laughs> Classic of my, comics? That was, my, that was one of my big education things. You see. No, uh, I, had, I had collected them all when I was about 13 or 14, and that's how I, you know, my only way I ever read any of the great novels, you know, was through the classic comics. <laughs> you, you don't feel you've missed anything here, eh? Well, I know I've missed a lot. Certainly I've missed a lot. Um, I do read a bit of history. History is the one subject that fascinates me more than anything else, I guess. And that I can read. Fiction, I mean, I can't really get to more than four or five pages of any book without just literally, just absolutely falling asleep. I mean, I, I, I turn to the last page. I read that and then that's it. I don't want to read anymore. How about, uh, well, how about picture books? Can you read those? Apart from comics. Yeah, I, I'm a great, uh, you know, um, coffee table book person. You know, like history of the old west or old trains or things like that. Or, I'm delighted to hear somebody reads those. I've been involved in putting some out, and some uh, callous publishers believe that coffee table books are merely furniture, that nobody actually reads them at all. And, but you do. At least you look at the pictures. Well, the ones that interest me, yes. Sure. It's interesting, um, in reading something about your background, what television seems to have done both to you and for you, it seems to have brought out many odd fascinations, uh, a fascination with old movies, for instance, which are exclusive to television, a fascination with World War I and World War II, a fascination with old music and old, you collect old records and things. Mm -hmm. There's this, this enormous wave of nostalgia 
for the immediate past, which is sweeping over the country, is, I think, a product of all movies and television. Yeah, I, I really got interested in movies because I, for some reason when I was about 15, I sort of got a, a tremendous attachment to uh, the 20s and 30s. And for that reason, I started watching movies on I would look in the TV guide every week, and if it said 1940, I wouldn't watch it. But if it was 1939, I'd turn it on and stay up no matter how late to watch it. What was it, what was it either about those, the style of those films or the tenor of the times that, that got to you? Well, I guess it was just the, the way they were always being romanticized, you know, the roaring 20s and, 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 and the aftermath in the 30s. I guess that uh, they probably weren't anything like they've been made out to be, you know. But uh, I, I just was always totally fascinated by it. I mean, I'm absolutely no interest at all in the 40s or the 50s, you know, which I thought were, you know. Well, that's too close to you, maybe. Perhaps, yes. You know, the 30s and 20s are fairly close to me, and uh, I think I'm more fascinated by the previous century. I'm not sure, though. Uh, what what kind of films in the 30s and 20s did you like? What were your what are your favorites? Um, I really I really enjoyed the social uh, films of the 30s. Of the Capra, Capra, Capra film? yes, especially, uh, and uh, Fritz Lang. who did several really outstanding. Metropolis films. and. Uh, yeah, but in the 30s in Hollywood, he did oh, yeah. uh, Fury and You Only Live Once, and. These so, were the early gangster, uh, some right. of the early gangster yeah. films. Uh, as a filmmaker yourself, don't you find Capra over, overly sentimental in places and unbelievable? Is it? Well, I think that that I was I was really uh, pleased to hear that when Capra was here about a, a couple of months ago, someone asked him what his best film was, and it's what I consider his best film, which is almost totally unknown film called uh, "It's a Wonderful Life," which is uh, not a sentimental film at all, and uh, it was made Jimmy Stewart, wasn't it? Jimmy Stewart, yeah. right. Yeah. Marvelous film. That and, and the one about the, the fascists, uh, Meet John Doe, I mean, they could hardly be considered sentimental. He's always judged by uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington yes. and, and Mr. Deeds Comes to Town. Well, or it happened one night. Right. Really wanted. But um, how about the, the style of those films? They're not the style of your films at all, these studies films. They move much more slowly. They're, I think they're much more literate in the print sense than your films. Mm -hmm. They're much... They're much more logical in the progression of the story. They have much more of a beginning and a middle and end, I would say, than, than your films. Wouldn't right. you agree with that? Well, in, of the later 30s, 30s, yeah, but I think some of the films in the early 30s were, uh, were highly uh, divorced from literary material, you know, the gangster films in particular, and compared with, uh, you know, the, the screwball comedies and, and, uh, and all those lush, uh, you know, Emil Zola, you know, yeah. all the... Uh, Paul that's, Muni things, right. you know, which were very, you know, theatrical. Uh, I think in the early days of sound was an exceptionally exciting period of filmmaking. And it sort of settled down after about 1935, you know. Because I know that you have said that uh, a good many films today are far too literary in style. I, they're, um, I'm thinking of, uh, well, some of the big historical soap operas we've seen, like yeah. Richard Bolton and that kind of thing. Well, you're, you, you concentrate much more on the visual image with a very light, thin script. Well, actually, I, both of my features have been much too literate for, for my taste. Really? Even yes. Yeah, much so. Uh, they relied far too heavily on, 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 the, on the script in that sense. Um, I, to me, uh, the more you, you are burdened with a script and a story to tell, um, the more difficult it becomes to make a real piece of, of cinema. And the trick is to find some kind of, you know, happy medium between the two, because basically free cinema is totally opposite to a film like Man of All Seasons or something like that, which is really a, a play. No, well, it is a play, it yeah. photographs. Uh, of course, there's room for that, too, on the screen. Right. But I, I, it's interesting to hear you first talk about the Capra films, for instance, mm -hmm. and then talk about this other kind of film, because it doesn't seem to me there's, there's a meeting place there. Well, I, I, don't, I find Capra's films a, a, a straight and... Uh, um, as literary as they are sometimes. They, they They're very literary. They yeah. depend on a very uh, sophisticated script. But uh, his, his appeal uh, to me is just in, I think we are sort of, uh, may perhaps see the world in somewhat similar fashion. You know. You're, it's interesting that you are a man who is obviously interested in periods. You're interested in yes. period baseball, I know. You're interested in early records, as I said. You're an old movie freak. Uh, both the films that you've made have been totally contemporary. They've dealt with exactly what is happening now. Mm -hmm. it, it, you use a terrible word and call them now films. Right. Uh, has it occurred to you that you might like to make a period picture? I would, but it, it that's, takes a lot of money. 
Uh huh. <laughs> I see. You'd have to get the bank. To work up to you. that one, right? What kind of a period picture would you make? I really would like to make a a, a picture about uh, a baseball story at the turn of the century, which was uh, baseball at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Why? I I find the the, uh, the the characters who played the game then, and I'm certain that you could understand this. Very fascinating. Very similar to the sort of characters that you talked about in, in City of Gold, you know. Uh, it really was the end of the Old West. Uh, most of the ball players there were surprisingly of German or Irish descent, you know, uh, and uh, a rough breed and uh, wild, uh, strange. Uh, just, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm much more fascinated by the, by the 19th century than I am by the 20th, but... Uh, oh, are you? Yes. Even more fascinated by the, by the 19th. Funny for somebody who's never read a book, how interested you are in history. Mm -hmm. This must again come from television, does it? I was always a, uh, always interested in history from the time I was in in, in, in grade school, very much. But so. how can you be interested in history and not read it? Well, you can Don't see you read an, any history books. You can see an enormous amount of history on television. I mean, look at the, the uh, Michael Redgrave films of uh, of the Great War. You know. Oh yeah, you can see quite a bit of it, but I don't know if you can see it all. Uh, there's an awful lot of history that you can't do very well visually. You can do a superficial. Thing visually. Well, I must say my, my interest in history begins to uh, uh, wane a bit when it, when it goes beyond the, in, behind or before the invention of the motion picture camera or the still camera. So when I see things painted and I have to look at a bunch of Roman statues and that's supposed to give me my impression of Rome, I mean, I don't know what that means at all, you know. So you can't really be interested in history before 1840, which is so the Garrett invented the Right. That's camera really about 1938, most didn't yeah. he? So it's ever since then. The, when was the motion picture camera invented? About 1895, 1896 mm -hmm. by Edison. So, you don't <laughs> care about the Greeks, the Romans, the Renaissance, or the cavemen? No, I wouldn't say that, but I, I really don't find it as fascinating because I can't you know, reach out and, and, and touch it as well as you can with the other stuff. He, you know, he told uh, the New Yorker magazine's reporter that he was McLuhan's child, and I think there's something in that. I'll be back in a moment to talk further with Don Shabib, the Canadian film producer, but first watch these commercials. I guess that going down the road, uh, from certainly from a critical point of view, is the most successful Canadian non-fiction film ever made. It exploded uh, in the United States. People like Judith Christ and many other reputable and respected critics put it on their best ten list in the year in which it was produced. Uh, the man who made it, um, you will be interested to hear if your parents broke all the rules, never did any homework at school, was going to be a chemist, was a University of Toronto dropout, went to theological school, that turned him against religion. Uh, none of this uh, education appeared to, to have been of any use to him at all. He got most of it off the TV set, which some parents won't let their children watch at night, including from time to time this parent. Or what are we? Are we doing everything wrong, we parents? Uh. I don't know. I really couldn't answer that. I think that... Uh, well, you see, my family wouldn't let me read the Shadow Magazine or Doc Savage when I was growing up, and I had to sneak it under the covers. But it may be that uh, that helped my imagination more than some of the things I got at school. I don't know. I, th I think so. I remember there was a big fuss, you know, what, 15, 20 years ago about the comics, you know, yeah, oh, which yeah. I thought was just, you know, so silly, you know. Violence in comics? Well, oh, that, that's yeah. what produced classic comics, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which has had more violence on them than most comics, but yeah. classical violence, yes. which is all right. <laughs> but you never did homework at school. Eh? You said you were a lousy student when you got out of high school. Uh, I got good marks, but high school didn't really tax me, you know. And then when I got to university, I went to engineering, chemical engineering, and I really got nailed to the wall there because I hadn't had, had no work habits at all. And uh, so I dropped out, and then I went back into arts, and then I started to buckle down a bit better. How come St. Michael's, and why did you go there, and why did well, it turn you off religion? I was uh, born and raised a, a Roman Catholic, and uh, it was really in my first year at St. Michael's that I just uh, just had it. You know, I, that was when I really started through a lot of changes. You know, really when I started, probably when when the media, you know, had that much of an influence on me. Um, I remember there was a long series on Darwin on the CBC that year, which I watched every night religiously, every every Sunday night, and uh, that was one of the things in, the, in, a, in a geography course. So just being educated, really, which you know, it's the, the prime enemy of religion, in my belief, is education. 
fascinating. It's uh, CBC will be delighted to hear about their course on Darwin, which I remember very well. It helped to turn you into a filmmaker because now the CBC is showing the films of the man who watched Darwin on the CBC 10 or 15 years ago. Going down the road has been on the on the CBC. What, however, what was the link that led you, what got you into the f films at all? You, you were obviously not going to be a filmmaker, you are taking chemistry of all things, or en and chemical engineering at that, which is about as far from a film, except a processing part that you can get. Right. Well, um, I, well I, ha I, was going, I had this fascination with the, with the you know, period of the 20s and 30s, and then one day I found out that you could see even older films if you joined the film society. So I did that, and I started joining film societies. And just through, you know, the years I went to college, I really got interested in it. And the older the film, the better, as far as you're concerned, huh? At that point, yeah, which was certainly not true. I think back on it, back on it now, but I, I really did feel that at the time. Did you see all those classics they used to run in the films? The Love of Jeannie Nay, remember that? Mm -hmm. and M and Metropolis and The Last Laugh and yeah. all the Russian films. I, I have a very, I have a, a sort of a built-in collector's mind, you know, and I sort of collect anything, and, and I would just sort of, you couldn't collect the films physically, but you could collect them in your head. Well, I saw that, and I saw this, so I started really going to those things religiously. If, going back into the silent era, what impressed you? What films impressed you then? I think more than any other film, Sunrise. Which that is, was, legit. was that Janet Gaynor and Janet Charles Gaynor. Farrell? No, that was Charles Farrell. That was in Seventh Heaven. That's yeah, Seventh George Heaven. George O'Brien. was made George by George O'Brien. Well, half that film is good, if I remember. The other half uh, was corned up by Hollywood. It, it's, 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 it's corny, but it's real, I mean, Puccini is corn, but it's first class corn. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, really, it was a beautiful film. There's a scene which he tries to draw on her, isn't there? And the yes. lake and the mist come up. Yeah. yeah I remember that. I really, I've, I just saw the film recently, about a year ago, and I, I thought it was just as great as I saw it when I, you know. When I was he went on to become a cowboy star in a... Yeah, right. Strange what happens to movies. What films do you like now, and what don't you like as a filmmaker? What influences are there on you, and what kind of film do you try to stay away from? Well, um, you mean as a, as a yeah. filmmaker? Or no, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a filmmaker who likes to go to the movies still, that's what I mean. Um, well, I generally go to films based upon their, who directed them. And um, if I've been burnt by a particular director, at least a, you know, I thought that films haven't interested me, I won't go see them anymore, no matter how much people say how they're great. Because even when they say that, I go back to it and it's still terrible. Um, I really loved Romeo and Juliet. I thought it was a marvelous film that, that Zephyr Ellie made. And uh, I like Arthur Penn's work. I think he's really a very Bonnie fine. and Clyde and yes. the other ones. What about John Ford? Um, I really love John Ford's films, but uh, again, uh, like with Capra, some of the ones that aren't really as highly praised as the other ones, like Wagon Master and My Darling Clementine, I think are his best works. Dialogue to you, I think, is secondary to make a film, isn't it? Well, there's dialogue and there's dialogue. There is dialogue that can be a little bit more, for want of a cliche word, cinematic than just straight. Plot is, is probably more so. Plot is really yeah. secondary. Right, yeah. And yet, in uh, the great days of the films that you like, the phrase that was used was Sam Goldens, who said, it's all very pretty, but where is the story, Sam Goldens? Where is the story? Yeah, my criticism of a lot of films I've seen recently is that they're, the films are beautiful, and uh, their technical effects are stunning, the scenery is pretty, but I keep waiting for this plot to begin. I keep waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. I actually keep waiting for John Wayne to walk in with both guns blazing in a couple of bad cowboy movies I've seen recently. Well, but things can happen without it being in a plot. I mean, there can be dramatic tension of, of, of a, not of a necessary, of a plot nature, you know. Like, you know, uh, somebody's going to do this next week and it's going to set off a chain of events sort of thing. Um, Although, like, one of the films I, I saw recently that I really enjoyed a lot, and I only went to see it because it had come back, was uh, the uh, Wilder film on Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. which is... Private Life of Sherlock Yeah, Holmes. marvelous, uh, charming it. film, you know. I mean, his technique was just dreadful. It wasn't even a close-up of the whole film, you know, <laughs> it was just straight camera work. But it was a really intelligently written thing and, and fascinating. But I get the impression from watching a lot of the new films by younger filmmakers that they're so obsessed with technical innovation or technical trickery that they've forgotten about the, the audience. That you have these beautiful lap dissolves that go on forever and uh, gorgeous jump cuts and everything else that uh, we, we've learned to appreciate from uh, television commercials, for instance. But uh, this uh, technique is surely not enough. 
No. Has uh, this been your comment on some of them? Well, there are there are some films that I've seen by particular filmmakers or whatever where some some people sometimes are, innovate a certain technique. Yeah. Uh, but to be successful, there's always some truth or some feeling behind that technique, and a sort of secondary filmmaker will come along and use the technique without the without the basis of what it was really meant for behind it. And then they become gimmicky, you know, like uh, slow motion. I've got some slow motion in my film. I've been using slow motion for you know, ever since the first film I made. It's, it's, if it's used and used right, it's not a gimmick. If it isn't, it's a cliche. Yeah, because Orson Welles certainly used a lot of fresh techniques or re reasonably fresh techniques in Citizen Kane, but he had a heck of a good story when he sure. oh, was in the foreground of that and used the techniques to further the story. You said you're not, you, weren't, you haven't been terribly satisfied with either of the films you've made, Rip Off or Go Down no. the Road. No, no. Has the Going Down the Road made you much money? Um, it's just about to now. It takes a long time for money to come in in, the, in this kind of it business. It costs you only 84000 which is an incredibly low sum to make a film of right. any stature sure. on. And you mean to say the 84000 is just now, after more than a year, coming back to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is well, I mean, I've got that. I mean, I've paid that back, you see, yeah. so now it's about to start making a profit. So from now on, everything might be gravy? I hope so. <laughs> What has been the reaction to that film uh, outside the large centers where people are used to a modern, sophisticated film? Have, have there been places where they haven't taken to it at all? Well, in Canada, it's been received very well everywhere. I don't know about the states. Like, I don't know how it's gone, say, in the Bible Belt or down in the That's south, you know, or in West Virginia, where people would really have a great deal of, uh, you know, in common with that story. You know, it did very well in the Maritimes, you know, for obvious reasons. Sure. Yeah. It seemed to me, looking at that film, that it was a very Canadian film, not just that the backgrounds and the environment is totally recognizable. Mm -hmm. And not just that some of the Canadian institutions, such as the beer parlor, were totally recognizable, which certainly made it a Canadian film, but that to some extent the style was Canadian. It uh, derived from the documentary style, which we've always done best. Is there something in that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, most of my, all my film training really came in the States, at UCLA. It's interesting because to me, looking at this film, it had the Canadian stamp on it. Mm -hmm. I don't mean a film board stamp, but right. something akin to that, something that uh, several other films made in this country have had. I, I would hope that if, if I was ever to be a successful filmmaker, that if I went to Los Angeles and made a film there, it would have the American stamp on it. Or if I went to Brit Britain, it would have a, Britain, a British feel to it. I think that's important. I mean, I really draw a route from things around me. Yeah. No, I hope if you go somewhere else, it'll still have the Canadian stamp, as Italian <laughs> films do, no matter where the director goes, and certainly Bergman's films do, no matter where he goes. Or maybe we'll just say it has the Don Shabib stamp on it. I'll be back in a moment. It's time for a commercial. Don Shabib's now going to make some money, finally, from going down the road, his first success. Will you use your own money in the next film, or will you use other people's? Um... Depends on what I'm going to do. I think I might like to do a couple of documentaries next before I get do another feature. I want to take my time into that. So, um, I'm never. I don't think I'm ever going to have enough money to really make a feature with. I hope you have enough money to make the period baseball film. I thought that was a nutty idea when the show started, but now I think that I'd like to see it. Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks you. for watching. You've been watching Don Shabib on The Pierre Burton Show, a half-hour program of conversation, opinion, and debate. This is Bernard Cowan speaking.